All right, good to see you. Glad to be back. Uh, I was had the privilege of preaching in Connecticut last week. I don't think I'd ever preached in Connecticut before. And uh, some of that cool weather followed me down south. I know you're enjoying that. So I appreciate Andrew Head preaching in my absence. You'll want to find 1 Samuel in your Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 1. I'll read verses 1 through 8 in a little bit. 1 Samuel 1, 1 through 8. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, there's one right handy in front of you in the, in the rack. There it's black. The green one's a hymnal, the black one's a Bible. You can find it on page 225 in the Pew Bible, 225, 1 Samuel 1 through 8. Appreciate Andrew Head preaching in my absence last Sunday. I know you were blessed to hear him. And, um, and then I have to tell you a couple of things. One is a new cycle of membership matters starts today. Delayed that a week uh, for, well, I was out last week and also for Labor Day weekend. So uh, that'll start. The first part of step one will begin uh, sort of sometime after I'm done preaching, about 945 in the conference room. So some of you registered to be a part of that. Some of you perhaps didn't but are interested in it. So you're welcome to just drop in there. First part uh, at 945 and then we'll continue the first part lunch after the second service and then uh, I'll teach the rest of part one of Membership Matters, or step one uh, this afternoon. So it's a good next step for folks. If you've been coming a while, perhaps you've joined a group. Now it's time to consider membership, learn more about the church. Uh, that's a great way to do that. So uh, I'd love to spend that time with you in a few minutes and then this afternoon. And then also next Sunday night, very important time in the life of our church. Uh, we'll have a members meeting at six o'clock. We'll hear uh, the recommendation from uh, the elders and the Long Range Planning Committee on uh, phase two of Renew and Revive. We've been hearing quite a bit about that, and uh, so encourage your uh, participation in that. So that'll be that vote. We'll also have the call vote for Fred Alcott back to eldership uh, in that meeting as well. Perhaps one or two other things, but those are the two uh, main things in the members meeting next Sunday night at six o'clock. Uh, also, there are um, samples of theater seats in the great hallway. And uh, there's a couple of them there. Uh, the color has not been chosen yet, so don't uh, get too exercised about the color, but you might want to sit on one of those. And you can see the sort of retraction mechanism and how that functions and all of that. So uh, that's in the great hallway. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at that on your way to a Bible study class in a few minutes. I think that's all I needed to say to you uh, at this point. Uh, so Samuel is a, is a big book, and, um, and it's really about big things with the people of God. Um, in the Hebrew Bible, it's not first and second Samuel, it's just Samuel. And it's like 52 chapters, something like that, if you put it all together. I think it's 55 chapters. And uh, so it's a big book, and it, and, it, and it deals with big subjects. It's, it's the move from judges to king, or maybe you might say from anarchy to monarchy. And it also charts the move from tent to temple, or tabernacle to temple. Those big, huge things that are happening in the storyline of the Bible in the Old Testament. And so you, you really wouldn't expect it, a, a, a book that is about really big monumental subjects like that to start with a rather obscure man from the hill country of Ephraim and a barren wife to that obscure man. You, you, would, you wouldn't expect that. You would, you would expect a big book dealing with big subjects to start with a, with a bang. And, and yet, if, if you're reading your Bible quite a bit, you may have noticed that the Lord doesn't typically start big stuff big. He, he starts to, he tends to begin small. And it's to his glory that he does. And it's also to our encouragement that he does because you probably don't feel like you're Mr. Big Stuff or whatever, you know, you probably don't feel like that uh, today, and I'm glad you don't, you shouldn't. Uh, 
But if you don't feel all that significant or large or important, um, the scripture encourages us and it calls us to trust the Lord when things start small. Um, so with that said, we're going into First Samuel today. This is the word of the Lord. Let's honor it by standing together. And I'm going to pray a little beyond the norm uh, in a moment after I read. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeraham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zoph, and Ephrathite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Penina. And Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? Let's pray. Father, there's a lot of hurt in this text and there's a lot of hurt in this world. Shootings in Georgia and uh, just last night, uh, shooting in Eastern Kentucky. Uh, thank you for the way you protected and are preserving life in the latter. And we pray Lord for healing, comfort, help and justice in all of these situations and we long for the day when you will um, make all things new and the Prince of Peace will reign uh, not only in our hearts but in your new heavens and new earth. Help me Lord as I try to preach you know my weaknesses and failures but we all know of your strength and power um, so would you manifest it we want to be faithful to you, Lord, and we long to be fruitful. Uh, so would you help us now? We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. You can take your seat. So I want to start this morning with, this, with the setting. The setting. This is, this is narrative. We're getting a story in Samuel and stories. A big story that we've talked about, but small stories that make up the big one. So start with the setting. Uh, there's this man from Ramathaim Zophim. Now that's a, that's a mouthful, isn't it? And as you move forward, every time that town is referenced, it's just called Rama. Rama. It's not well known before 1 Samuel, before 1 Samuel chapter 1, but after that it becomes quite well known and we'll, as we work through this book, we'll understand why. So. Don't worry about pronouncing it. I'm sure I got it wrong, some Hebrew scholar would tell me, but just Rama will suffice. But it's not a big place, not significant, at least to the first hearers of, uh, of, of 1 Samuel. Uh, there's two settings in the text. One is Rama, and then the other is Shiloh. Rama, about five miles north of Jerusalem, and then uh, Shiloh, about 15 miles north of Rama. So this obscure man, Elkanah, is going uh, back and forth. He'd go annually from his place in Rama to, um, to Shiloh. And Shiloh is where uh, the center of Jewish worship was taking place at the, this particular juncture. Joshua chapter 18, verse 1, they set up the tent of meeting, the tabernacle, they set it up there at Shiloh after the, uh, they had 
taken over the tribes and all of that in Canaan land. They finally occupied the land sufficiently. They set it up there at Shiloh. It wouldn't stay there forever, and we'll see how it stopped staying at Shiloh uh, in 1 Samuel. But for now, that's where it was, and this was the appropriate place to go to worship. And Elkanah would go with his family up there twice a year. So we kind of have two settings in these first eight verses, that obscure village of Ramah, and then a, a significant place of worship in Shiloh. And then we should also talk about the situation, so the setting and the situation. And the situation is not a happy one. Um, Elkanah has two wives. Now, this is not the main thrust of the text, but I think it's a point that I need to make, and I think it's an important one to make. So the Bible says early on, Genesis 2, 24, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and unite to his wife, singular, and the two will become one flesh. But as you work through the storyline of the Bible, that gets violated, and it gets violated significantly and and. And often, first in chapter 4 with a man named Lamech, who had two wives, Ada and Zillah. And then a little later with Sarah and Abraham's lack of faith, Abraham taking Hagar as a concubine and having Ishmael by her. And, And then you have Jacob taking sisters, both Leah and Rachel, and then also their servants. And then you have even worse violations than bigamy and polygamy uh, with at least what's threatened at Sodom, with what happens with Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar, with Lot and his daughters. As you work through the Bible, although the Bible doesn't come out and clearly condemn these violations, well, it, it does condemn a lot of them. It doesn't condemn the violation in the Old Testament of polygamy. It says on the front end what marriage is, and polygamy is clearly a violation of it. But every time you see the Lord's pattern violated in the Bible, it's always a sad story. It just, it just always is. It, Every time, if somebody can come up with a happy story, uh, I mean, I'm not saying there was no happiness in David's life or Solomon's life, but I'm saying when it, as it relates to the violation of biblical marriage, it's always sad. It's always painful. It's always sorrowful every, every time. And in our day, we need to know that. And our violations, talking about societally, our violations are getting just as egregious as some of those horrible Old Testament violations. And the sadness and the sorrow and the pain typically shows up, not so much with the husbands in these situations, but as with the women and with the children. And the sorrows multiply. And in our days, it's these horrible violations that happen societally, but also within the church. We have our own failings too many times in recent decades. Many practice serial monogamy. That's a violation of what God says in Genesis 2, 24, and we ought to grieve it. And we ought to know the lesson that we're told from these stories that that kind of brokenness brings all kinds of trouble and sorrow and it multiplies. It multiplies. Now, that's not the main thrust here, but it is a thrust of the biblical storyline and I just didn't want us to miss it. Okay, so situation, two wives. Now, the the likelihood is that, and we we know from the text, from what I read, that Elkanah preferred Hannah, that he loved her. The, The likelihood is that he married Hannah first, that she was the wife of his youth. The Old Testament doesn't 
condemn polygamy, but it does talk about the wife of your youth, and you're not to violate that covenant. And so it holds up that as special and privileged and unique. It's likely that Elkanah loved Hannah. We know he loved her. And it's likely that he married her first, but then she's barren. And you got to have sons. You got to have children in an ancient society. In our day, it seems of less consequence, although I think it's of more consequence than people tend to think. But you had to have it. Uh, it was ancient social security. It just was. When you got old, you can't get out of bed anymore. You can't keep going out and working in the field, whatever. Then your kids take care of you. That's the way it worked. And in our day, it's a little different, although maybe it ought to be a little more like that than it tends to be. So if you didn't have any kids, what was going to happen to you when you got old? It's a big question. Years ago, I went on a mission trip to uh, West Africa, and we were working with a church in a little village there uh, that we've invested in more than a decade. And, uh, and there was a, a man who was a member of that church, and he was contemplating a, taking a second wife, which in that culture was entirely appropriate, not that church culture, but that broader culture. And, and the reason was he only had daughters. He had no sons. And in that particular West African culture, it's the sons and their wives who were to take care of the son's parents when they got old. The daughters were to take care of their in-laws. But the sons were responsible. He didn't have any sons. So what was going to happen to him? So he was going to take a second wife who could hopefully have a son for him so he'd be taken care of in his old age. That was, the, that was the pressure. I don't know how the story turned out. He hadn't done it yet. I hope he never did. But you can understand the pressure of it. And Elkanah, under that kind of pressure, rather than trusting God to provide, he, he takes Penina. And Penina... Uh, as fertile as she can be. And she has sons and daughters, which means she had at least four, right? Plural daughters, plural sons, at least four. And it's likely considerably more than that. And she delighted in it. And Hannah is brokenhearted. That's the situation. And Elkanah is trying to <laughs> shepherd all of this. <laughs> which is nigh on to impossible, wouldn't it be? And why is it nigh on to impossible? Because of a biblical command, the biblical view of marriage is violated. And you cross that boundary, how do you, how do you fix it? And it's full of complications and complexities. So we got setting, we got situation. And the bulk of our time we need to spend on the characters. The characters. Who's the first character? First character is God. <laughs> okay. You should have known that. Did you know that? The first character is God. The first character is always God. Every story in the Bible is about God, whether he's mentioned or not. And he's not mentioned much here, is he? But he is mentioned. And he does do something, or he has done something, and it's important. Now, we're going to call God the Lord of hosts because that's what the text calls him. Elkanah would go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh. This is the first time the Lord of hosts shows up in the Bible. You find it a lot after this. You don't find it at all before this. And Lord of hosts, Lord is the word Yahweh in Hebrew. It's the covenant name for God in the Old Testament. Uh, when Moses didn't know what his name was and asked him, he said, I am that I am. That's where all of that starts. Yahweh of hosts. And that's really talking about the ten thousands upon ten thousands of angels in heaven. And he is this God of enormous power who rules all those angelic beings and certainly rules here. He's the sovereign Lord over all of it. He's the first character in the story and the last character in the story and the most important 
character in every Bible story. The Bible gives us a lot of insight about people, but chiefly, mostly, most importantly, it gives us insight about God. He's revealing himself to us. So he's called the Lord of hosts, and he's presented as an appropriate object of worship for Penina and Hannah and for Elkanah. But he does one thing in the text, and we're told twice that he does it. The end of verse 6, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Because the Lord had closed her womb. So it tells us twice here, the Lord had closed her womb. Surely, surely the Lord wouldn't do something like that. Surely something's off here. Whoever's writing this book must get it wrong. God would never, God, God never does anything to us that would, that would bring pain or sorrow. He never brings, he never permits, he would never do that. That's all Satan. Satan does that stuff. God never does anything like that. Or does he? Of course he does. He will hurt. But he will also heal. And it's crucial that you know it. Loved ones, we don't need a theology that gets God off the hook on the hard things in this world. You might think you're going to win if you do that, that he's this small God over here that really can't do anything about the sorrows in this world. He, he, he just kind of comforts us and encourages us in our trouble, but he really can't do anything. You don't need a God like that. You might think you're winning by getting him off the hook. He's not responsible for trouble and all that kind of stuff, but in the end you're going to lose because you're going to have a puny God and you're going to be terrified to live in a world so broken, with so much trouble and sorrow, and it's completely untethered. He's just kind of watching, but he's not engaged. He's not in charge. Nobody is. We don't need a theology like that. You don't need that. Now, it's hard. And sometimes your belief of Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God, will be pushed, and sometimes it'll be pushed to the limit. And many of you, it's been pushed to your limits more than it has in mine. And I get all of that. But if we're going to be a Bible people, we have to believe what the Bible says. So the Lord had closed her womb. And that hurt. And we don't really know why. Um, And often when God brings something in your life that hurts, often you're not going to know why. When I read the book of Job, as the reader, I find out in chapter 1 why all this stuff happens to Job. But I read all the way through 42 chapters of Job, and as far as I can tell, Job never finds out. He never finds out. Finds out when he gets home. He doesn't find out in this life. What the Bible does tell us is that there is a reason, that there is a purpose, that God is in control, and he knows what he's up to. Ministry staff was at the Sing Conference uh, put on by the Gettys in Nashville uh, much of the past week. I don't think in all of my life I've ever sung as much as I sang Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of the past week. And I am a singer from a singing family, and I sing a lot, and we sing a lot. But, wow, we sang a a lot. (laughs) Encouraged me about the glories of heaven, because, you know, to tell you the truth, I really didn't get tired of it. Really didn't. It was glorious. We sang lots of stuff and lots of new songs and all this kind of stuff. But there was this one line that caught my attention with reference to what I was going to try to preach to you all this morning. and, And it had these lines in it. I don't know what you're doing, but I know what you've done. That's a good line, isn't it? And I think Hannah doesn't really know what the Lord's doing here. But if we're readers of the Scripture, you know, if we're paying attention, then then we should should know that God loves to, um, he loves to start small, 
And he loves to start in a way where the odds are absolutely stacked against you. And then out of that hopelessness and helplessness to do something great. So God closed her womb. But we know, because we read our Bible, we know that Hannah's in a, a fellowship of suffering that is pretty rich. Baron Sarah, Baron Rachel, Baron Manoah's wife, Samson's mama. Go to the New Testament, Baron Elizabeth. And then even a more radical Mary, or a radical miracle, is Mary, the virgin. How could she be anything but barren without a husband? So that's the Lord. Closed her womb, Lord of hosts, completely in charge. But he's up to something. He's not the only character in the story, though. And the, there, there's, there's another one here. There's Penina. Penina. Let's call her malicious rival. Malicious rival. Penina's just mean. I mean, I, I'm having a hard time reading it. She's the consummate mean girl, isn't she? I mean, that's, that's, that's what she is. She's delighting in the barrenness of Hannah, and she's delighting in her own fruitfulness, She's got four kids or six or eight. We don't know how much, but she's provoking Hannah. And she's provoking it at this tenderest spot in her life. It's Hannah's Achilles heel. It's the source of her greatest pain that she's barren. In the Old Testament, there's all kinds of shame that came along with that and guilt and sorrow for her husband, sorrow for herself. All of that's going on here. And at that tenderest spot, Penina's going right at it. And not only that, but also in the tenderest, in the tenderest situation setting, she hits her at worship. Once a year, they go to Shiloh to worship the Lord. I just want to ask you, is worship emotionally evocative for you? Those of you that have had your hearts broken in one way or another. It is, isn't it? Sometimes it's hard to walk through the door and be here and sing the hymns and take the sorrows before the Lord and be vulnerable in front of brothers and sisters that see the tears in your eye. Those things can be hard to do. Worship is a, is a tender place for the suffering, and we should be sympathetic to that and empathetic to that and, and sensitive to those realities in the way that we care for and love one another. And Penina just goes at her. We don't know exactly what she's saying, but we can imagine it, can't we? And couldn't we imagine the way that she might make use of her kids as props to produce more pain in Hannah? They don't have to give us all the detail. The writer doesn't because we can imagine full well what Penina is doing and how Hannah is hurting. Loved ones, we live in a day where a lot of this goes on. Penina might be the consummate mean girl, but there are a few others in this world, and they love to get on their phones um, and inflict pain. Sometimes they like to do it by um, platforming their glorious face and figure and perfect life so that you'll feel horrible about yours. It's a little subtle and indirect, but it produces, it has the desired effect. And, and sometimes they just go for the jugular and attack and bully. And the social media opportunities to do this are great. It's way more than once a year. It's anytime you care to. And it ought not to be named among the people of God. And the girls aren't the only ones that can do this, but it's a female text, isn't it? So maybe we ought to apply it there. 
Don't do it. Any impulse you have to viciousness, absolutely refuse it. Penina would have been better to keep her mouth shut, wouldn't she? But what God requires of his people is a whole lot more than not inflicting pain. Isn't it? I mean, we're supposed to weep with the weeping, aren't we? And as bad as the bigamy is here, as horrible as it is, Hannah and Penina are close neighbors, and Penina should have cared for her, should have wept for her sorrows, should have sought to comfort her. So don't pat yourself on the back because you're not inflicting any pain, because you're not bullying anybody, because you're not being vicious. No, you're called to watch way more than that, to weep with the weeping, to comfort the afflicted with the comfort with which you've been comforted by God. Heard the report this past week of one of our student workers who has a reputation. Her reputation is that whenever there's a kid on the periphery, that seems a bit marginalized. That's where she runs. Man, I just loved that when I heard that. That's where she runs. Not to the ones that have all their friends and they're having a good time and everything's fine, but the one out there alone. She runs to that one. She's got eyes to see it. Maybe we could be more like her and less like Penina. And then there's Elkanah. Elkanah. Let's call him faithful yet failing. Faithful yet failing. You might disagree with me. I, I always thought Elkanah's doing pretty good. I mean, he loves Hannah and he's trying to take care of her. He knows she's hurting, so he gives her a double portion. And he says, am I not more to you than ten sons? I mean, isn't our marriage, our relationship enough to make you satisfied and happy? And it just seemed pretty good. But my dear wife, she doesn't read the story like that. And I, you know, I tend to trust her. And so it caused me to dig in a little deeper. What's going on here? Is this good? And and then, not only did I hear Lisa say that, but I heard Alistair Begg preach this text, and he said what Elkanah should have done was he should have said, I love you more than ten sons, not am I not more to you than ten sons. You think Begg's right? Would that have been better? I think so. But I think he could have even done more than that. He could have wept with the weeping. He also could have prayed for her. When I gave you the list of the barren women in Scripture, I left one out. She's not well known. There's only like one verse or two in Genesis chapter 25 that even talks about it. And you kind of got to know your Bible and read a little further outside of that text to even get it. But Rebecca was barren, and she was barren for 20 years. And Isaac, her husband, prayed for her. And the Lord heard his prayer for his wife. And she conceived and gave birth to twins, Esau and Jacob. And so the line continued. You could have prayed for her. You guys that have a wife, are you praying for her? The Lord convicted me of this recently, that I wasn't, I was praying for you guys, I was praying for our kids, I was praying for our grandkids, I was praying for missionaries. The most important person. I wasn't praying for all that much. I'm not saying I never did it, but it, it wasn't as central to my spiritual pursuits as it should have been. How? how? Maybe you're like me. Maybe you haven't been doing that faithfully. He could have said better than this. And he could have done better than this. If you read in the RSV, it doesn't say he gave a double portion to Hannah. It says he gave one portion to Hannah. And the Hebrew apparently is a little obscure. Most of the translations go the way the ESV goes, but it's a little uncertain. If he only gave one portion to Hannah, it's saying even though he loved her, he only gave her one portion because he wasn't going to show favoritism and partiality. 
If it goes the way ESV goes, then it's saying he gave her a double portion because he loved her and he's trying to give her this comfort. He's faithful. He's taking his family to Shiloh to worship every year. And they're giving the offerings and, and they're eating before the Lord the way they're supposed to. He's trying to love these wives and shepherd them well, but he's not doing a great job at it. I think he's failing to a considerable degree. So while this is a very female bent text, there's something for the guys here. First Peter 3, 7, live with your wives in an understanding way. So, man, I asked you a moment ago, are you praying for your wife? The second thing I would ask is, are you in touch with her burdens? Are you aware of her struggles and do you care about them? Do they move you to prayer and sensitivity and love and tenderness? Those are important questions. Elkanah is not as aware as he needs. I mean, he could do worse. He's, why are you sad? He knows she's sad. I mean, he's, he's sensitive enough to figure that much out, but his, his response is less than it ought to be, and maybe yours is too. Maybe the Lord would bring repentance in your life today. And then Hannah. Hannah. Favored yet barren. Favored yet barren. Her name means favored one. Or grace. What's your definition of grace? The one I grew up with is unmerited favor. Hannah is the favored one. How could the favored one be barren? And she's brokenhearted. And you know what? We could correct her theology here. We could say, Hannah, what, in the, what is wrong with you? The Lord is your shepherds. You shall not want, even for children. We could, Romans 8, 28 her, couldn't we? Till the cows come home, and we could just say, you, we could be like Job's friends. We could fix her misplaced theology. We could rebuke her lack of joy in the Lord and all these kind of things, right? Isn't that what we should do? I mean, you, you sense some wrongness here, that this desire has gotten a little bit out of control and more than it should be, and shouldn't we lean against that? Maybe down the road at some point, but you don't start there. She's a favored one, and yet she's barren. And while we might think her desire is stronger than it ought to be, maybe there's a very good reason in the sovereign plan of God for that really strong desire. And in the Old Testament, she's not the only one. You see it with the women all the way through, it seems. And while we could rebuke her in our modern day, is it not true that our desire for children might be too little? Often, not always, but often. Certainly in the broader society, it definitely is too little. But even in the broader society and even in the, unlike the places sometimes you find it. Now what I'm going to do now is dangerous, um, and I understand when I'm doing something fraught. Uh, Thursday night, I watched the Chiefs and the Ravens play. I saw Taylor Swift in the luxury box watching her boyfriend play for the Chiefs. and Her boyfriend was participating in the breaking of my Raven heart Thursday night. And, and so on Friday, I listened to the first Taylor Swift song of my life. So, loved ones, I understand that I could be clueless about Taylor Swift. But, but the one I listened to was L-M-O-L, L-O-M-L, got the order wrong, L-O-M-L. And, and that's a, some of y'all don't understand this like me, but when you get these little acronyms, you know, when somebody's texting you, L-O-M-L is supposed to mean love of my life. But uh, the song is a play on words, and it's not love of my life, it's loss of my life life. And she tells the story of an old boyfriend that had, he was talking rings and talking cradles. And in the end, it came to nothing. Claimed to be a lion, but really he was a coward. 
and their field of dreams burned at his arson's match. And he had told her a million times, I'm the love of your life. And she ends the song, you're the loss of my life. So Taylor Swift, who seems to have the world by the tail, has this haunting desire to be a wife and a mother. Now, the Swifties can correct me if I'm misinterpreting the song, which is entirely possible, but I, but I, I don't think I am, but you'll have to work to persuade me, but I, I'll be corrected if I need to be. But isn't there something horribly painful, but also something beautiful about that? A woman who has everything, but has lost her life, what she may be hungered for most. And I think for Hannah, it might even be more than that. It might even be more than that. It might connect with Genesis 3.15. And, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And they always knew that some son of a woman was going to turn the curse backwards, was going to overturn sin, was going to make it all right again. They, they knew it was coming. And, and it might be through me. And so there's this God-given desire and hunger that's a good thing that ought to be affirmed and encouraged and prayed for. Hannah, favored one yet barren. And then the final character in the story is the people of God. The people of God. You see, in the Old Testament, God has a bride, and it's his people. And Samuel is less about Elkanah and Hannah or Eli and Hophni and Phinehas or even Samuel and David and Saul. It's largely about God and his people. That's really what it's about. And Israel is the favorite of God, and, and yet she's, she's barren. When, when you read later on in the, in the, in the book, you, you, you get it here at the, end of, at the beginning of chapter 3. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. One verse previous in verse 1, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. That, that's really the synopsis of this entire first seven chapters. That's really what's going on. The priest can't see. And we'll, we'll see it next week as he's insensitive to Hannah's pain and sorrow. The, the priest is blind, and a word from God is rare. And the lamp of God has not quite gone out, but it's, but it's flickering. And Hannah's barrenness is a picture of the barrenness of the people of God in the Old Testament. And today from this text, if we're going to do anything at all, we ought to grieve our own barrenness. Our church is doing good in many ways right now. It's flourishing. We're growing. Less today than I was expecting, but most of you are frequently having to hunt to find a seat. I'm rather happy about that. I'm grateful. And I am. Don't get me wrong. And the second service seems to be growing too. And it was bigger than this one a couple of weeks ago, and all that growth and the need to at least contemplate and provide for more space is, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for all of that. But when you start asking the question, how much of the growth relates to people that don't know Jesus coming to know Jesus and their lives being changed? It's not what I would want. Is it what you would want? Do you feel fruitful in your evangelism? Or do you feel barren? You could feel faithful and yet not fruitful, barren. I think today's the two-year anniversary of Jennings Creek. I'm thankful that they planted it. And I think on this two-year anniversary, they're baptizing five. So I'm so incredibly thankful that the Lord allowed us to plant that church. And that is a evidence of a level of fruitfulness that the Lord has given us. But loved ones, aren't you hungry for, aren't you hungry for more? 
And don't we understand that all our methods and slogans and everything cannot produce fruitfulness? Only God can. If our womb is barren, only God can fill it. But he can, and he loves to. And so we ought to cry out to him. And if you're here and you're not a Christian and you feel barren, you feel like you're Ephesians 2, 1, as for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins. And you can't make yourself come alive. You can't give yourself a new heart. You can't wash your sins away. You can't cleanse your life. You can't change it. You can't do any of that. And you feel utterly helpless and hopeless. That's the, that's the best place for you to be. To admit, I can't save myself. And I don't know what you're doing. Hannah couldn't look back on the cross and know what he's done, but we can. We know he died for sinners on the cross, that he bore our sin and our sorrow, and that our barrenness somehow can give way to being born again. If you'll repent and believe this gospel, and our church, and even our community and our nation, the Lord really could awaken and revive us. Stood by the graveside of Timothy Edwards. Last Saturday, the father of Jonathan, the leader of the first great awakening, and I stood in the middle of a place where God is little known anymore, Windsor, Connecticut, where once the rivals, the revivals took over those communities. He can do it again. He can do it again. When it seems like the lamp is almost out, Often, that's exactly when he's ready to do something great. That's what we'll see in Samuel. That's what I hope we see at Rich Pond. That's what I hope you find in your life as you turn to Christ. Let's pray. Father, please help us. Um, help us to feel our barrenness. And may it put us on our knees. May it cause us to cry out to you for life, for fruitfulness, for faithfulness. Work these things into us as individuals and families, as a church, even into our community. This we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.